Good morning. This is the service for May 22nd, 2019, the sixth Sunday of Easter. <clears throat> we begin with Come You Faithful, Raise the Strain, hymn 487. Come you faithful, raise the strain of triumphant gladness. God has brought his Israel into joy from sadness. Loosed from Pharaoh's bitter yoke, Jacob's sons and daughters led them with unmoistened foot through the Red Sea waters. Tis the spring of souls today, Christ has burst his prison, and from three days sleep in death, as a sun has risen. All the winter of our sins, long and dark, is flying from his light to whom is given laud and praise undying. Now the queen of seasons bright with the day of splendor, with the royal feast of feasts comes its joy to render comes to gladden faithful hearts which with true affection welcome in unwearied feet strain Jesus' resurrection. For today among his own Christ appeared bestowing his deep peace which evermore passes human knowing. Neither could the gates of death, nor the tomb's dark portal, nor the watchers, nor the seal, hold him as a mortal. Alleluia, now we cry to our King immortal who triumphant burst the bars of the tomb's dark portal. Come, you faithful, raise the strain of triumphant gladness. God has brought his Israel into joy from sadness. We're using Divine Service Setting 3, found on page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We will continue with Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. 
Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its, yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. We sing the Gloria Patri. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. For our hymn of praise, we will sing hymn 470, verses 1 and 9, O sons and daughters of the King. O oh, sons and daughters of the King, whom heavenly hosts in glory sing, today the grave has lost its sting. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. On this most holy day of days, be laud and jubilee and praise to God your hearts and voices raise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We turn back to 189. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit, let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for today comes from Acts chapter 16, and it serves as the basis for our sermon. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, Immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, the seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from the Revelation of St. John, chapter 21. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the whole city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. 
having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a, like a jasper with twelve clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels. And on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We turn back to page 190. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 16th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus said, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn of the day is hymn 556. Dear Christians, one and all rejoice. It will be verses 1 through 4. So 556 verses 1 through 4. 
Dear Christians, one and all rejoice with exaltation springing, and with united heart and voice and holy rapture singing. Proclaim the wonders God has done, how his right arm the victory won, what price our ransom cost him. Fast bound in Satan's chains I lay, death brooded darkly o'er me. Sin was my torment night and day, in sin my mother bore me. But daily deeper still I fell, my life became a living hell, so firmly sin possessed me. My own good works all came to naught, no grace or merit gaining. Free will against God's judgment fought, dead to all good remaining. My fears increased till sheer despair left only death to be my share. The pangs of hell I suffered. But God had seen my wretched state before the world's foundation, and mindful of his mercies great, he planned for my salvation. He turned to me a father's heart. He did not choose the easy part, but gave his dearest treasure. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Paul was transformed by Jesus and chosen out by Christ to be his apostle to the Gentiles. A couple of weeks ago, we noted that Paul had no choice, that this was a decision of God. Paul had chosen otherwise, and God had turned him, making him repent and sending him on a new path. Well, his new path was to go through Asia, spreading the gospel of the Lord. And Paul embraced that path eagerly. He became the great apostle to the Gentiles. But here in our text, in chapter 16, Paul is continuing in his zealousness. He's going out, he's saving souls. He's gaining for God new children. And though the world has attacked him and caused him great pain and suffering, Paul continues to eagerly go out to serve the people of God as a tent maker and an evangelist, to gather together people around him who help in his service. Not just service of preaching the word and dealing with issues of the soul, but also service to the body of feeding widows and orphans and helping out those in need of gathering together a church that gives comfort both spiritually and physically in time of joy and sorrow. And so he eagerly wants to return to those churches, to go around those churches, to grow and continue to strengthen the followers of Christ. When a vision comes to him, It is a vision of a man from Macedonia. Now Macedon is most famous, or Macedonia, sorry, is most famous for Philip of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great. So it is the place from which the Greek Empire sprang, the empire which was replaced by the Roman Empire at the time of Paul, but which still has great influence upon the society of the time. He is being directed by God to go from Asia or Asia Minor into Europe, into the locations to the west where there are barbarians and from which the Roman Empire sprang. And so Paul travels, as it says in our text, to Macedonia. Not his choice, not his plan, but God's plan. In fact, he travels to the city of Philippi, from which we get the name of the letter to the Philippians, one of the letters Paul will later write. And there, 
at Philippi, he has heard that there's a place of prayer, a place where people meet who are Jewish or of the way by a river. And so he heads with his men down there to preach and teach, to try to start a new church. You see, when Paul enters a town like Jesus entering a town, he starts with the foundation laid by those who came before, by the prophets and by those who've shared the Torah, by the teachers in the synagogues. He starts with that foundation and shares the word around that. But when he gets to the river, he finds women, not men, unexpectedly put in his path. And yes, he's converted many women, but normally he's a man and he deals with men. It's maybe not even always proper for men to be dealing with women. But here they are. And like Jesus before him, Paul preaches to the women and the women here. In particular, a lady named Lydia, a woman who's in charge of her own business. Now, we don't know why she has this lead position. Uh, she might be a widow. She could be an only daughter, um, maybe some other reason. But she's in charge of, of a part of the purple cloth making industry in this area. Very expensive cloth, a, uh, a very um, well-kept secret uh, way of creating purple, a rare, very rare color at the time. Um, to, that earns a lot of profit for her and the, her family and her city. So he meets Lydia, and Lydia listens to him. She has been raised in the Old Testament faith, and when she hears about Jesus, it opens her eyes, it opens her ears, so that she knows that this is the Messiah. Sorry about that. We had someone come into the office. Um, so Lydia, uh, she's a wealthy um, purple, purple cloth merchant. Um, and as a wealthy purple cloth merchant, um, Lydia has a, a household and a large place, a large residence, which includes probably a lot of people who work in her, uh, in her industry who help her with delivering the goods, dyeing the goods, uh, getting the goods prepared, maybe even creating the goods. And after she hears what Paul has to say, her house becomes Paul's home base, the place where they can start the church from, where they can spread out and communicate with all the surrounding areas. And later on in scripture, we learn that Lydia continues to help support the church in Europe and Asia Minor, um, and she is a great influence upon the people of this region and others as she shows the great blessings that she has learned about from the Lord that have freed her up to love and bless others. Paul comes to Macedon, not at his own behest, but at God's. Paul comes to Macedon seeking out men to become the foundation for the church there, and instead he comes to a leader of the church is a woman named Lydia, according to God's plan, finds her by the riverside. And then Paul baptizes her and her whole household, probably including slaves, servants, children, uh, you know, older adults, baptizes her whole household, and the church in Philippi begins. It is interesting the way God works and it's not always according to our designs, our plans, how we think it ought to happen. At my previous congregation back in Kansas, a missionary was headed toward Topeka, and the people there in this town of Vassar, the Germans, they heard that a pastor was coming close to them, and they sent out a wagon to find him and ask if he could come and serve communion there and baptize people there. And he did. And a few other areas around that place, other small towns sent for him. And so, yes, he did his mission in Topeka, but he also did his mission 
in those surrounding towns. And he became a visitor, a circuit visitor, we would call it. We would travel from town to town, to place to place, serving the community of God. The origin of our church came when a man back in Germany heard about the benighted Germans who were not receiving the education of the Lord. And so he raised up young men, not into the full pastorship, but into kind of a, a beginning pastorship, and sent them over as Svetsenlingas to be pastors, to be real pastors, not, not temporary or partial pastors, because a pastor is a pastor is a pastor, and to serve in the pastoral office. And then they would continue in their training as pastors so they could receive some of the education that we do think is valuable and important, though the truth is they were full pastors equal with any other pastor. But they came over here because they learned God let them know it was time to send people over here and begin to teach and to preach and to bring baptism and communion, the word and the sacraments to those who needed it. And God's plan happened and grew the LCMS. We could look at our very founders of the LCMS, at Walther and others, who came from Germany because there was an attempt by the Duke of the time to pull the Lutherans and the Presbyterians into exactly the same worship. And they came over here and expected to be a city on a hill, the, the Lutherans. But instead, they had great problems, and their leader had to be exiled. He was doing ill things. But out of that, God created this church that we have. Today, we have a beautiful place here in, in Waverly and Quarter. Two buildings wonderfully gifted to us by the people who came before, maintained by those who are here presently. And we gather together as families and congregations to hear the word of the sacraments. And we know this is the will of the Lord. He's told us, that's what Jesus is saying in the, the John text when he says, you ask this in my name, anything you ask of the Father in my name. He's saying, when you say, Lord, send us your word, send us your forgiveness, he does. And he raises up our children to know Christ. So that's what Jesus is talking about. So we are here, we gather together, we do it in our ways that have been set by those previously, but are now the ways that we continue um, there was some discussion about times. I tend to try to have those not be changed because that causes conflict. But here's the thing. In the United States, there are going to be less pastors unless God performs an unexpected miracle, and he might. There are going to be less members of churches because unfortunately, the people of, of the United States had things too easy and they started looking on religion as unimportant, not raising up their kids to know Jesus Christ and turning their backs upon the constant return to word and sacrament. And what may occur, not according to our will, but according to God's will, is different ways of gathering together to be a church. Things like we presently have now that the other churches in our region don't, where we have two congregations sharing one pastor so that this pastor can be there for word and sacrament at both locations because both locations on their own aren't able to support a pastor alone. A change that God had and God instituted, but that we probably didn't originally see as happening. And I look at other churches in our region that are getting small, and the question is, will they have to alter what they're doing? Maybe we're going to start having pastors go to more than two churches, three or four, and have a circuit visitor situation. Maybe we're going to have congregations say, oh, I don't know, Ernestville, which is now calling a pastor, having to share a pastor with some other location. 
like the Good Shepherd Home. These possibilities have been ruminated on and considered, at least among us pastors, as we look at what's to come. And as we see shrinking congregations, maybe we'll have to change the way that, that we meet or the way that our, our buildings are upkept or maybe we'll have to change the way that we have our school. I don't know. But here is what I do know. I do know in this case where Paul wanted to go one way in Asia and God told him to go to Europe, to Macedonia, to Philippi, that that was God's plan and it worked out wonderfully. That new churches were started, wonderful places of God. That Paul, who thought, oh, my mission is probably going to be to the men first, to the synagogues, ended up having his mission come to Lydia, to the women. And that started this wonderful church and she became one of the leaders in his church. So what I do know is that God, when he changes our plans to his plans, when he alters the way things are going so that we do according to what he has designed, God's purposes result in what's good for his kingdom. For all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, according to his purpose. And I do know that God's purpose, in a certain sense, never changes. God gives us his word, which is unchanging and unvarying. And so at church, we may do it in a different place at a different time, but we do the same thing. We preach word. We do sacrament. Promise attached to some physical reality, some gift God has given. We do the things of God. We meet together as a fellowship of believers, one body in Christ, no discrimination. We call pastors, men chosen by God through the, the congregation or through other means similar, like a board of bishops or in other religions or a pope. Men chosen by God so that they can give word and sacrament. Those are the unvarying, unchanging things that are part of God's plan. He's told us that those are not going to be altered. But he might alter what the altar looks like. He might alter where the altar is. Yeah, I'm doing a pun there. God's plans don't always follow along with our plans. You see, when we look at our church, we think it should just keep growing and growing. And that would be good, by the way. And that this building will last for a billion years. And that we'll be doing church uh, uh, with the same order of worship for the next millennia. And um, I'll continue to wear an alb. And, you know, you could start running through these things. And it'll always be Waverly and Quarter. That may not be. It is right now, and it is good right now. But God may have other plans for us. And as pastor shortages continue, maybe we will have to expand into three churches. Or, you know, churches in the region may have to gather together in a different location and join together. We don't know yet. But what we do know is that like with Paul, when God has a plan, and when he tells us to accomplish it, probably not in a vision like he does with Paul, but in other ways, we should listen to him because his plan produces good results. His plan produces salvation for many in the kingdom. Our plans and our purposes, God encourages us to make them. But then we test them according to his word, according to his revelation. And if they're not standing up to the test, we come back to his word and listen to him. We come back to him and we pray 
Guide us, Lord, in the way you want us to go, not in the way we think is right. And then God will guide us. He will direct us forward in different, using different means. He will direct us to accomplish the things that he has planned. Just as God accomplished the things he planned through Christ the Savior in a way we didn't expect. So we say, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We're going to continue with our prayer of the church. Um, I don't have my listing of those for whom I need to pray. We will pray on Sunday for them. Because of that, uh, in this video, we're going to use a prayer found on page 294, I believe. It's the Daily Prayer 295 for morning. And it starts this way. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For the joy of the resurrection among us, for the fruit of faith nourished by the word and the sacraments, for faith to live in the promises of holy baptism, for one's calling and daily works, for the unemployed, for the salvation and well-being of our neighbors, for schools, colleges, and seminaries, for good government, and for peace for deliverance against temptation and evil, for the addicted and despairing, the tortured and depressed, for those struggling with sin, for marriage and family, that husbands and wives, parents and children live in ordered harmony according to the word of God, for parents who must raise children alone, for our communities and neighborhoods, for the church and her pastors, for teachers, deaconesses, and other church workers, for missionaries, and for all who serve the church, for fruitful and salutary use of the blessed sacrament of Christ's body and blood, for the preaching of the Holy Cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for the spread of his knowledge throughout the whole world, for the persecuted and oppressed, for the sick and dying, for faithfulness to the end, for the renewal of those who are withering in the faith or who have fallen away, for receptive hearts and minds to God's word on the Lord's day, for pastor and people as they prepare to administer and receive Christ's holy gifts. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. We'll continue with our hymn of thanks. Hymn 801, How Great Thou Art. We'll use, use verses 3 and 4. So 801 verses 3 and 4. But when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home 
what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 Our closing hymn is hymn 479, Christ is Risen, Christ is Living. So hymn 479. Christ is risen, Christ is living, dry your tears, be unafraid. Death and darkness could not hold him, nor the tomb in which he lay. Do not look among the dead for one who lives forevermore. Tell the world that Christ is risen, make it known he goes before. If the Lord had never risen, we'd have nothing to believe. But his promise can be trusted, you will live because I live. As we share the death of Adam, so in Christ we live again. Death has lost its sting and terror. Christ the Lord has come to reign. Death has lost its old dominion. Let the world rejoice and shout. Christ the firstborn of the living gives us life and leads us out. Let us thank our God who causes hope to spring up from the ground. Christ is risen, Christ is giving, life eternal, life profound. He is risen. He has risen indeed. Hallelujah.